We are continuing our series Sunday Classics, and uh, the byline under that is Classic Stories, Modern Faith. And uh, as we think about some of these stories, it's interesting, uh, some of the Bible stories that we grow up with, that we think about, and, and there may be other stories too that we learn when we're young. You know, uh, when we go to Genesis and we think about creation, and, 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 we think, and then we think about the fall of man, and in the fall of man, we have Satan comes and he embodies a snake. And so like when we think about that, we're like, well, we know who the, the villain is, right? It's the snake. It's Satan. We go to the story of, of David and Goliath. Remember that story, of course? And, and you have this giant who mocks God and the people of God. And then you have David, this young boy who believes and trusts in God, and God brings a great victory as David slays the giant. And the, the evil person is the giant, right? And the, the hero of that story is the shepherd boy, David. And there's good and there's evil. And certainly in our world, we know that, that God is good and that Satan is evil. And those two forces work against one another. But then there's us. And we like to think of ourselves as heroes on the side of good. And yet, sometimes, are we always the truth is that most of us, our lives, our circumstances, our relationships often become complicated or messy. You know, I don't see it as much anymore. Maybe it's still a thing. Maybe I'm just not paying attention. But for a while, it used to be real important what your Facebook status was. You know, are you in a relationship? Are you out of a relationship? Now, for me, it was always easy because I was married by the time Facebook came along. And so that, that's been my relationship status. But then for some people, it's complicated, right? Man, I'm married. I've been married for 30, almost 31 years. And it's still complicated sometimes, just to be honest with you. Um, this morning, we want to look at a story that's pretty messy, Maybe not at first, but when you really start to dive down and understand what's happening between the different characters, it's a messy story. Now, there's a hero for sure, and the book is named after her. We're going to look at Ruth chapter 1 this morning is where we're going to begin. But it's a messy story. But as we look at this classically messy story, it should give encouragement and direction for us because sometimes it's complicated and it's messy with us, with us as well. In Ruth chapter 1, in verse number 1, it says, In the days when judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and two sons with him. You know, it's interesting. I was talking to someone this week, and they were talking to me about their family history. And they said that in the, uh, I believe the early 80s, they left Colorado and they moved for a couple of years to California because there was no work in the industry where her husband worked, and they had to find work. And they lived there for a few years, and then they moved back to Colorado. Similar situation, except for that it wasn't a lack of work. It was a lack of, of rain. It was a famine. And the crops, it, it doesn't say it was a drought, but it was something that made the, the harvest difficult. And so there's this guy who lives in Bethlehem. He's a Jewish man. He's living in the land that God promised him that he said would flow with milk and honey, but there's a famine. And his reaction to that is to gather his wife and his two sons and to move to the land of the Moabites. We don't know exactly where they settled, but that was probably a 50 or 60 mile move. 
Not too big a deal if you have a U-Haul, but if you're carrying everything you own and walking, it's a pretty big transition. It's a pretty far move. Verse 2 says the man's name was Elimelech and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Epaphrathites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. Epaphrathite, that, that just means like a Bethlehemite. Easy for me to say. Bethlehemite. A Bethlehemian. A guy from Bethlehem. That was the area, the Epathra. I, good thing I don't live there. They'd just be like, you know that guy that can't really talk? <laughs> so it, he was from that area. He belonged in that area, but he moved. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. Then Elimelech died, and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, and the other named a woman named Ruth. But about 10 years later, both Malon and Kilion died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. When Then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah, giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. We don't know exactly how long she lived there, at least 10 years. And so they had settled in this area. But now Naomi, this woman who's lost both of her sons and her husband, is returning to the land that she grew up in, where she was from. A couple of things as we begin to work through this chapter, I, wanna, I want, want to make sure we are all, are all on the same page about. Elimelech did not follow God's command because God had commanded the nation of Israel to go to the promised land. Bethlehem is part of the holy land today or what the Jews referred to as the promised land. God said all the way back to Abraham, wherever your feet trod, I'm going to give you this area. And, and then God brought the nation of Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery, brought them to the edge of the promised land. Moses dies. Joshua takes over, takes them in. They have the great victory at Jericho, the defeated Ai. We talked about that this summer. And then they're settled in this land, and the judges are ruling. Last week, we talked about Deborah and Barak, who had a great victory. And so you have these different kind of city-states, these different uh, villages, different congregations of Jews in the land that was the promised land. And God said to him over and over, I'm going to give this to you. You're to go in. You're to occupy it. You're to take it. This is the land that I'm going to give you. Matter of fact, when they went in, uh, the different tribes of the nation of Israel, they got different sections of land. And then the different clans got that land. And then individual families. And so they had a place. When it says that Elimelech was from Bethlehem, that he was a, an apathrophite, it was this was his place. And when things got tough, he left. He left. If you read on to Ruth and, and study about it, you'll know that that land there in Bethlehem was still deeded to him. It was still a part of his lineage and heritage. Naomi came back, and that was, that was a part of the story of Ruth. We're not going to really look at that this morning, but I want you to understand that Elimelech left. Not only that, but his sons married Moabite women. That was absolutely forbidden. When they were into the promised land, God said, listen, there's all these different foreign uh, people. You can't intermarry with them. That's not what I want you to do. I want you to stay a people to myself, to, to, dedicated to me. And he says, the reason is, if you marry them, then you're going to go after their culture, their gods. Their gods. 
And so you've got to stay a, a pure people to me. Matter of fact, in Numbers chapter 25, we'll not take the time to read it, but specifically Moabite women, uh, some, some Jews married them or, or had relationships with them, and they led them into pagan worship, and God judged them. Twenty-some thousand people died as, as a result of following after these pagan gods, and it began by this intermarriage. Now, the, the hero of the story of Ruth, Ruth is a Moabite woman. See how this is complicated? It's messy. Elimelech doesn't stay where God had promised. He goes to the land of Moab, and then whether it was over the objection of the parents, it doesn't seem like that. Both of his sons marry Moabite women, did exactly what God told them not to do. And yet that's the situation that we find. But Naomi is going to head back to Bethlehem. And so in Ruth chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, with her two daughters-in-law, she set out from the place that she had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. But on the way, Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, go back to your mother's homes, and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who could grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' home, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. Things are far, too, uh, far more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. And again, they wept together, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Now, this is an interesting passage, and again, in our culture, maybe a little bit difficult to understand. But Elimelech has two sons with Naomi, and so those boys are responsible to take care of their parents. And when they took wives, they brought those wives into their home. They were a part of their family. And so when they died, Orpah and Ruth were tied to Naomi. But you have three women together and no men. Now you say, for some of you, you're like, oh, I bet that was a clean house. <laughs> you know, they could keep some things organized. There was good communication, right? For some of you, that sounds like a good deal. But in that society, in that economy, women weren't working. Women didn't own property. And, and if there was no man, then these women were destined to poverty. That was simply the way it was. It, even, even a relative would first take care of his more immediate family. And so Naomi and Ruth and Orpah would be destined for the leftovers, the scraps. That's what they were facing. Now there were rules and there were, there were societal norms about, about death and marriage and remarriage. And if Naomi would have had other sons who hadn't married, they would have had an obligation to marry their dead brother's wife in order to uh, propagate that line so that their uh, inheritance, their line wouldn't die out. Now again, that's kind of a foreign concept to us, but that's what Naomi's referring to. She's saying, I don't have any other sons. And even if I did have some other kids, are you gonna wait until they grow up and not marry anybody else. And, and uh, we don't know exactly what ages uh, Ruth and Orpah were, but apparently they could go back home and they were still young enough that they could marry somebody else. 
And then they'd be taken care of. Then they wouldn't be in the, in the, destined for this poverty. They wouldn't be going to a foreign land. And so while it's emotional, the Bible says that Orpah left. But Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi, verse 15 of Ruth 1. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. Now, that's an interesting thing that she says there, right? She's gone back to her people and also gone back to her gods. Because while Elimelech apparently left the promised land during the famine and allowed his sons to marry Moabite women, they weren't idol worshipers. They worshiped Jehovah God. And now Naomi says, just go back to your family, go back to your gods. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. What I, I want you to see a couple of things about Ruth. The first thing is Ruth honored her commitment even when she was given an out. Even when she was given an out. And this was a spiritual decision. Naomi says to her, go back to your family, go back to your gods. But she says, no, I'm going to, your people are my people, your God is my God. And then she invokes the name of Jehovah God. She says, may the Lord. She doesn't say, may these pagan idols that my family worship curse me. She says, may God in heaven. I take a vow by the God in heaven that I'm going to follow you. I'm going to live where you live. I'm going to die where you die. I'm going to honor my commitment. It's interesting, and I, I thought about that this week. We have no idea. We don't even know which son Ruth was married to. The Bible doesn't say that. It says there was two guys, Malon, Chilion. There was two women, Ruth, Orpah. We don't even know who went with who. We don't know anything. This is all we know about the sons. I just read it to you. They lived, they died. They had, they had wives. But something happened in that family that Ruth heard enough about God that she decided to be committed to Naomi and to God Almighty. That's what I, one of the things that I love about this story is here's this woman who grows up. The Jews are, are distant relatives to the Moabites, but they had been enemies. There have been several occasions where the Moabites didn't show the Jews kindness, where when the Jews had relationships there, God judged them. I mean, they were at odds. And yet she finds herself married to the Jewish guy. And through that process, she becomes a follower of Jehovah God. And she said, I'm not going back. Might it have been better for her? Might she have been able to find another husband? I don't want to spoil it for you, but she finds a husband in Israel, so apparently she was able to find a husband. But she didn't know that. In Ruth chapter 2 and verse 20, Boaz says to Ruth, May the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge reward you fully for what you have done. This is really what Ruth did. She decided not to pursue what would have been more comfortable for her materially and take refuge under the wings, under the, 
in the land of God Almighty. She was already living in Moab. That was her country. She was going to a foreign place. But she was following after God. And she was following after God even though she had an imperfect example. It's funny as a pastor, I'll meet people and they'll say, oh, I used to go to church, preacher. But somebody did something that wasn't in line, it was unchristian. Somebody hurt me. Maybe it was a minister. Maybe a minister was dishonest or uh, immoral or whatever. I, I, I don't want to shock you, but you might have noticed that occasionally happens. And it doesn't just happen to ministers. It does happen with ministers, but it happens with all kinds of Christians, right? People that say they're, they're followers of Christ and then act the opposite of that. And then people say, I, so I don't go to church anymore because somebody hurt me. Listen, if you're in church long enough, somebody's going to hurt you. I don't want that. I don't want, I don't want to be the cause of that. But the, the truth is, we are all imperfect people. And church, like our relationship status sometimes, is complicated. It's messy. We're not always, we're often not what we should be. We serve a holy God and we sang of his holiness today. We don't sing about the holy church because we're the church and we're not holy. We have a holy God. We have holy scriptures. We don't have a holy pastor or holy congregation. And Ruth had an imperfect example. Elimelech, the, the patriarch of the family, had left the promised land. Her own husband committed a sin when he married her. He disobeyed God's command. And yet, even in that, she said, your God will be my God. I'm going to shelter under the wings of the Lord Almighty. That's an encouragement to me. Because I know that I am not a perfect example. And yet that doesn't mean we can't find truth. And so Ruth decides to return with Naomi. And Naomi, whew, she was a joy to be with. Ruth chapter 1 and verse 19. So the two of them continued on their journey. So Naomi and Ruth are going together to Bethlehem from Moab, probably some 50 or 60 miles. They're going together, and I imagine Ruth has some questions. What's Bethlehem like? What's the area like? How do you think the people will react to me? This is Naomi, her traveling companion. When they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was excited by their arrival. Is it really Naomi? The women ex asked. Naomi's reaction, don't call me Naomi, because Naomi means joy. It's a, it's a happy name. Instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full. Did she go away full? Wasn't there a famine? But she did have a husband and two boys then. But the Lord has brought me home empty. I'm sure Ruth was like, that makes me feel great. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? You see several places in this book where Naomi really is a bitter woman. She's returning to Bethlehem, but she, she says, God has raised his fist to me. 
But God told the Jews that they, they were to stay in the promised land. God told the Jews that if they intermarried, he would judge them. Now, I'm not saying that her boys were killed because they married Moabite women. The Bible doesn't say that. But Naomi sees the circumstances of her life and feels like God hates her. She says, you can't even call me Naomi. God's dealt bitterly with me. God's raised his fist towards me. Matter of fact, one commentator that I read said, that perhaps one of the reasons why she wanted to send away Ruth and Orpah was so that she wouldn't be reminded of the sins of her sons. That she wouldn't carry that back to Jerusalem, or to uh, Israel, to Bethlehem. And certainly she doesn't return in repentance. Proverbs uh, or excuse me, Psalm 51 and verse 17 says this, the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. See, there are times when circumstances come in our life and sometimes they are judgment. And what God is looking for from us is repentance. But sometimes our re reaction is bitterness. This was Naomi. She said, you can't even call me Naomi. I left full, but now I'm empty. And Ruth is like, we're together. Wherever you go, I'll go. Whatever you do, I'll do. Even in the midst of that, your God will be my God. Naomi's God doesn't seem like a God I would want to serve. And yet Ruth was faithful. She honored her commitments, even when she had a chance to leave. Even though she had imperfect examples, she recognized the truth of the Lord God Almighty. And then God began to work. In Ruth chapter two, beginning in verse number one, it says this. There was a wealthy and influential man in Bethlehem named Boaz, who was a relative of Naomi's husband, Elimelech. One day, Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go out into the harvest fields to pick up the stalks of grain left behind by anyone who is kind enough to let me do it. Naomi replied, all right, my daughter, go ahead. Now, this is one of the things that that women, um, men with no land or work, people that were impoverished could do. They would grow different kinds of crops and the harvesters would come and they would harvest it. But they had rules about that. If as they were harvesting something, they dropped it, they weren't always allowed to bend over and pick it up. Sometimes they had to leave it. And then there were people that would come along behind and they would gather those things. And they would literally be supplied. They would live off the scraps. And so harvest time rolls around, presumably motivated by their lack of, of something to eat, their poverty, Ruth says to Naomi, hey, let me go find a field. Let me see if I can pick up some scraps. If somebody is kind enough to let me do that, let's see if I can do it. And Naomi says, go ahead. So Ruth went out to gather grain behind the harvesters, and as it happened, she found herself working in a field that belonged to Boaz, the relative of her father-in-law, Elimelech. You know, we've talked a couple of times as we've gone through this series about the idea of waiting on the Lord. Remember when, when they had the Battle of Ai and they were defeated because uh, a man went in and he took the treasure from Jericho that God had said belonged to him. And he didn't want to give what belonged to God. He wanted to take it for himself. But if he would have just waited, God gave 
the, 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 the Israelites, all of the plunder, all of the, the spoils of victory after Jericho. The same thing was true uh, when the nation of Israel was waiting on Moses and he was up on Mount Sinai and God was giving the law and the Ten Commandments and they got impatient and they created the golden calf because they needed something to worship and they didn't wait on God. And we've talked a couple of times through this series about the need to wait on the Lord. But that doesn't mean we don't do anything. Like we can't just go, well, you know, God, I've got a need, so um, I'll just wait. Ruth believed in God. And belief, faith, always real faith, always comes with action. Our saving faith, our faith in when we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior requires that we believe in him, that we repent of our sin. Faith requires action. And so Ruth, who was hungry, probably praying about it, but also went out into the field. Interesting, Naomi there's no record of her going. Now, maybe she wasn't physically able to. We don't know. But Ruth went. She put her faith in action. James chapter 2 and verse 14 says this. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anybody? Can that kind of faith do anything? Ruth worked hard. Ruth chapter 2, verse 4 says, While she was there, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem, greeted the harvester. The Lord be with you, he said. The Lord bless you, the harvesters replied. Then Boaz asked his foreman, Who is that young woman over there? What, who does she belong to? And the foreman replied, She is the young woman from Moab who came back with Naomi. She asked me this morning if she could gather grain behind the harvesters. She has been hard at work ever since, except for a few minutes' rest in the shelter. We, uh, my wife and I got the privilege uh, back in June to go to Israel. And it was an amazing experience. We got to go to Bethlehem. Uh, probably looks a little bit different today. Um, but one of the things we got to do was go through, uh, in Nazareth, we got to go through this little village where they had excavated things, but they also recreated it. You know how they'll do, they'll, they'll be like, this is what it was like in the first century. And so all the guys had towels on their heads and they all wore bathrobes and uh, not really. I mean, they, but they had costumes, right? And they, it, it was really cool because there was a potter and he had like a, a hand potter's wheel and he was making different clay things. They had a carpenter shop. They had a synagogue, which was an amazing thing to see. But one of the things they had there, uh, the, it was on a hillside and it was terraced. And they had all kinds of different things growing. They had olive trees and they had uh, figs and they, and they had a, grape, uh, a grapevine. And I was, I was thinking about this, this this week because of this passage. And then this morning, we sang that song where it talked about he is the vine and we are the branches. We need to abide in him. And the way this grapevine was grown, I'd never seen anything like it. You had coming out of the ground these vines, and they were probably, you know, inch, inch and a half in, in diameter. And they grew up. There was no leaves on them, but they grew up and they had built this uh, this arbor, this covering, and all of the grapes grew up high and they formed a shelter. And so all the grapes were above you and, and we're going through this thing and we had gone to the sheepfold and it was kind of built into a, the side of a rock and, and there was a shepherd and, and you went around and it was warm. And then you stepped under that grape arbor. And it was shaded. And the breeze was blowing. And it, was, it was awesome. It was a great place to be. 
It was either that or one of those white pop-up tents that you can buy at Costco. That's what he's talking about here. Um, probably not the pop-up tent. That's some kind of a shaded shelter. But what does the foreman say? She took just a little bit of rest. The distinguishing characteristics of Ruth. Notice how he describes her. She's a Moabite. She came back with Naomi. Everybody knew the story. But he said, man, she's working hard. She's out there in the field. She just took a short rest. She's been laboring all day. She's a hard worker. That was what the foreman said about Ruth. Ruth worked hard. She didn't get discouraged. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 13 says this. As for the rest of you, dear brothers and sisters, never get tired of doing good. That's a funny verse, isn't it? Like, on the one hand, would you get tired of doing good? But doing the right thing can be hard sometimes, can't it? And doesn't it seem like if you do the right thing, certain things ought to happen? And when they don't happen in the time period in which we think they ought to happen, doing good can be difficult. You ever try to get a handle on your finances? You're like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit down and I'm going to make a budget. And, and we're going to budget this out and we're going to save and we're going we're gonna to give and we're going we're gonna to really try to live well. We're not going to use credit cards. We're not going to go into debt. And, and, and you're excited about it. And then you think, man, I could save, you know, $100 or $500 or whatever. And, and over like 10 months, I could, I could really have some money. And so you're all fired up. And you get that budget. And then... You get invited to a birthday party and you have to buy a present and you run over a nail and you got to buy a new tire. And you get to the end of the month and you think, budgeting doesn't work. I'm broke. And if you're not careful, you get tired of doing good. The same thing can happen when we fight a sin in our life, when we try to institute certain spiritual disciplines in our life. You ever really try to get up early and, and get fired up and you read scripture and you spend time in prayer and then it seems like things are more difficult, not less difficult? Seems like God's not blessing. He, it seems harder. And we get tired of doing good. Do you wonder if at some point when the sun was right overhead and she'd already been working for hours, her back was aching because she's just picking up scraps that she didn't think, maybe I should have gone home. Maybe I should have gone back to my family. Maybe I should have gone back to my family's gods. Yes, I know that lifestyle's not what it should be, but this is not all that great. See, following God is absolutely the only way to live. And, and God will bless you and guide you and lead you in things far beyond what you could ever imagine. But if as you take steps of commitment and faith, you will always be tested. Always. And it's often not easy. Because if Satan can put a roadblock in our way and get us to turn around or get us to turn to the side, he's going to do that. And the, the tremendous thing I see about Ruth is even when her mother-in-law was bitter, even when her mother-in-law gave her an out, 
Even when she got to Bethlehem and she was having to pick up the scraps in the field, she was faithful to God. She was working. She didn't grow tired of doing good. And she was rewarded for her faithfulness. Ruth chapter 2 and verse 8, Boaz went over and said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, stay right here with us when you gather grain. Don't go to any other field. Stay right behind the young women working in my field. See which part of the field they are harvesting and then follow them. I have warned the young men not to treat you roughly. And when you are thirsty, help yourself to the water they have drawn from the well. Ruth fell at his feet and thanked him warmly. What have I done to deserve such kindness, she asked. I am only a foreigner. Yes, I know, Boaz replied, but also I also, but I also know about everything you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I have heard how you left your father and mother and your own land to live here among complete strangers. May the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. A couple of things as we wrap this up this morning. Our God is a faithful God. And a faithful God rewards faithfulness. Psalm 37 in verse 23 says, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall for the Lord holds them by the hand. Once I was young, the psalmist says, and the psalmist here is David. He says, once I was young and now I am old, yet I've never seen the godly abandoned or their children be begging for bread. You know what David said? God's got you. Not that you won't stumble, not that things won't be difficult, but God is a faithful God. He will never leave you or forsake you. He will always be with you. It doesn't mean he's always going to bless you just the way you want him to in just the timing you want him to, but he will not leave you. He is a faithful God, and he rewards faithfulness. And I see also that Ruth's reputation was rewarded. Proverbs 22 and verse number one says this, choose a good reputation over great riches. Being held in high esteem is better than silver or gold. It wasn't that Ruth worked at, to, to make sure that people thought about her in a good way. It's that she did good things and her reputation preceded her. People knew. What did the foreman say? That's the foreign woman. That's the widow that came back with Naomi. But he also said, she's a hard worker. And Boaz knew about her. He knew she was faithful. He knew he, she had sought, shot, goodness, sought shelter. Say that, don't say that. So, some of you are like, it's easy. Sought shelter, sought shelter. That's it, twice. I'm not going to push it. Under God's wings. Boaz knew her reputation. And what, he, what, what the foreman reported, what he saw in the field, was exactly what he had heard. And Proverbs says, choose a good reputation over great riches. Hmm. That is not the value of our society today, is it? I mean, do we value anything over great riches? I mean, people will embarrass themselves, debase themselves, do all kinds of foolish things if they think it will lead to great riches. Well, I don't care what people think about me if I could be rich. If I could be rich enough, I could just buy my friends, right? I could buy my reputation. But Proverbs says a good reputation is to be chosen over great riches. That it's more valuable than gold or silver. 
And so we need to do what is right. We need to honor our commitments like Ruth did. We need to, to, to be at work believing and trusting in God, but also putting our faith in action. I love the story of Ruth because as you read on in verses chapters three and four, Ruth eventually marries Boaz. It's a big romantic story. I, no, I mean, it's kind of weird when you read it in our, from our societal standpoint. Like, you know, we would want something like, Ruth was walking in the rain and Boaz came with an umbrella and an outdoor waterproof speaker and they threw away the umbrella and danced in the rain. It was beautiful. Isn't that how they go? I've seen different clips of the Hallmark movies. There's probably a puppy, an old pickup truck and a Christmas tree lot in there somewhere. You know what I'm saying? Like when you picture Boaz, he has like a three-day stubble. Like he's not unkept, but kind of rough. Rich, but sensitive, you know? Flowing hair. Some of you are like, I like a Boaz. <laughs> Got a bunch of, co- bunch of Project Impact girls are like, oh, yes. <laughs> That's not how it happened in Ruth 3. There was like a threshing floor and she slept by his feet. It was weird. (laughs) Then Boaz goes to the city gate, takes off his shoe. It's all the cultural things because Boaz had the right to marry Ruth, but there was a closer relative and they had to work it out. And in the end, Boaz and Ruth get married. And The Bible already told us that Boaz was wealthy and successful. She went from picking up scraps in the field to being married to a wealthy man. Naomi was along for the ride. She was blessed as well. Matter of fact, Ruth is the great grandmother of King David, the giant slayer and the the second king of Israel. Ruth is in the lineage of Jesus Christ. God takes what began with Malon or Chilion sinning against God, disobeying God and marrying a Moabite woman and puts that woman in the line with Jesus. It's complicated. It's messy. But Ruth honored her commitments, and Ruth trusted God and put her faith in action. Let us learn from the example of Ruth. I want us to close with one of my favorite verses, and I use this verse a lot. But Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 9 says this, so let's not get tired of doing what is good, At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Our gracious God, Lord, we thank you for this story of Ruth, for this woman who, not a Jew, not a Hebrew woman, But God, having been exposed to Almighty God, she said, that will be my God. I will follow after him. She was faithful like God. You are faithful to us. She put her faith in action like you would have us put our faith in action. God, I pray that we would be encouraged, inspired, motivated by the example of of Ruth today. Lord, even though our circumstances can be complicated, even though our examples are not perfect, God, you are a perfect, faithful, holy God. Help us grow our faith, God. 
Help us put that faith in action even this week. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.